Hello and welcome to Makatawa Unmanned Public Safety UAS Program Overview. Our purpose today is to help you understand what it takes to start a UAS program for your department. Makatawa Unmanned Systems is a team of military officers, pilots, remote pilots, and training designers that are dedicated to help you integrate these programs. We have over 10 years training and integrating unmanned systems into the U.S. Army's operations. And since early 2016, we have been supporting local and state departments like yours to develop high quality unmanned programs. I'm Jeremy Latchaw, and I'm here to help you through this process of determining what equipment, the processes and procedures that you'll need, and how to actually develop your department's UAS program. Today we're going to cover the basics of a program and some considerations for you to think over and discuss with your team prior to consultation with us. This will ensure we have the basic understanding of the laws, most current equipment, and your needs based on the limitations and constraints like money and time. We will begin with the FAA Certificate of Authorization, its pros and cons. Next, we will talk about FAA's Part 107 certification, as well as its pros and cons. Then we will discuss the different types of equipment available today, to include zoom cameras, thermal imagery, parachutes, and other types of equipment that help support your operations. We will also discuss the basic strategies for purchasing the equipment based on their price ranges. Finally, we will talk some other considerations your department will want to discuss as a team. First, let's discuss the FAA Certificate of Authorization. This is one of the older ones that's been around a little while longer, and it's part of a public entity. The Certificate of Authorization, or what they've called COA, is the longest running way that public entities receive their FAA authorization to fly unmanned air aircraft systems in the national airspace. This process is the only, only for public programs, meaning government organizations, departments, programs, etc. The liability uh, and the responsibility of this program lies with the public organization that applies. The applying entity will create their own policies, documents, and will self-certify their pilots based on the approval of the protocols based in that FAA's COA process. There are two types of COAs. There's a blanket and there's a standard. Often the standard one is also called jurisdictional. It's the same thing. The blanket allows you to fly in Class G airspace throughout the country but limits the altitude, daytime, and to daytime operations. A jurisdictional or standard, which is what the FAA calls it, gives approvals to your protocols to fly at night in given airspace classification other than G. And then it also gives you different other waiverable missions that you request. The waivers are constrained to your jurisdiction, which is why it's often called the jurisdictional standard or jurisdictional COA. The standard COA is constrained to your jurisdictional area which is why it's often called the jurisdictional COA. The pros of the FAA COA is that you self-certify your pilots, meaning the protocol you get approved for by the FAA to train your pilots will be the standard for how your pilots are trained. This allows more flexibility in how your department is determining your pilots, how you train your pilots, and it makes it a little bit easier. You don't have to take a test. Secondly, getting a COA allows your program to be more legitimate, meaning it is truly a department program based on the written protocols that you get approved by the FAA. We have also seen many insurance agencies require departments and local municipalities to have a COA in order to get insured for their UAS program. You'll want to discuss this with your insurance companies. One of the main cons of the COA is the monthly reporting process mandated by the FAA. Your waivers are also restricted to your public's jurisdictional area, which can be a constraint to some public safety departments in a mutual support operation. 
There are such things as an emerging COA, which will help you in a mutual support situation. Another con to the FAA COA process is it's a long process. In some instances, it could take up to a year based on the local uh, air traffic authorities and how often you basically play the ping pong back and forth between the FAA and the person that's managing your department's COA process. Now let's talk Part 107 certification. Part 107 is a civil aircraft operations section for the UAS. This regulation came out in 2016 and is the only process to receive commercial UAS license. The Part 107 is categorized as a civil aircraft operation and its, limit, its liability falls on that individual pilot. This is why some insurance agents are requiring departments to receive an FAA COA. To receive a license, a Part 107 license, you must be 16 years old, speak and write English, and pass the 60 question remote pilot exam. Once completed with the, and passing with a score of 70% or higher, the individual can fly under 400 feet during daylight hours, three statue miles of visibility, and only in Class G airspace. Here are the pros and cons of flying under Part 107. First off, the pros. Part 107, you can fly in Class G airspace, as I discussed before, below 400 feet without, and here's the key, without reporting to anyone. Now that can make it a lot easier on public departments. Being able to fly in Class G airspace without reporting or requesting authority to do so. Meaning as long as you fly within the guidelines of Part 107, you can fly anywhere in the country in Class G airspace and you do not have to file a report. Now that doesn't mean you don't file uh, an individual uh, flight log or anything like that. In fact, you're supposed to. But you don't have to go back on the FAA's website and actually physically write a report every month. You do not have to file this report with the FAA for flight operations in this case. The only time a Part 107 pilot files a report with the FAA is because of an accident, which uh, you will get this report procedure in your Part 107 uh, test prep classes. Also, Part of 107, you can receive waivers for night, classified airspace, and other missions based on your need and risk management procedures. The cons of Part 107 is that the pilot must be trained based on the FAA standards, which one is they're constantly changing. Two, uh, it could get more in depth later, the cons of Part 107 is that the pilot must be trained on the FAA standards, pass the test, which can cost money, and it definitely will cost the pilot a lot of time in studying. Also, as stated earlier, some departments have issues with their insurance companies, and the insurance companies does not support the public department having a Part 107 solution. Again, that's probably one of the first things you need to do is contact your insurance agent, figure out if they need a, uh, a COA or if they're okay with having a Part 107 certified pilot as part of the program. Here's the breakdown of the two different ways to receive authorization to fly in the national airspace, specifically for public departments. It starts with the creating a public declaration level. It starts with creating a public declaration level it starts with creating a public declaration letter, which often, it starts with a public declaration letter, which could take a little bit of time based on your city's or municipality's attorney. You gotta develop best practices, which could take a little while, especially if you're not familiar with the, the practices of a UAS. And you must register in the FAA CAPS, which, is starts your process out, but could take quite a bit getting through. The part 107, you gotta pass a 60 question FAA exam at a 70% or higher. And then you start to keep maintenance logs and pilot, pilot logs based on uh, your flights. Now, 
Most of the time you're going to do that anyways if you have a COA or a Part 107. In a lot of municipalities, the reporting procedures are already there for wanting to know exactly what their UAS is used for. So most likely you're going to do all those anyhow on either side. And then both of them require you to register your UAS in the same manner. For more information on, on the requirements for a COA and a Part 107, uh, reach out to us at info at